Ben Nash here. I'm a co-founder at XY Advisor and founder of financial advice business Pivot Wealth. My business baby I started from scratch a bit over six years ago. In that time, I've leveraged some of the learnings of the XY community to scale the business and become one of the better known financial advice businesses for high income accumulators. You can join me each Tuesday as I have the privilege of interviewing some amazing people where I'll selfishly be able to uh, continue my personal journey to improve every aspect of my advice process and hopefully you can learn a few things on the journey as well. Jump over to xyadvisor.com if you haven't signed up already to share and learn from other advisors or simply download the app. First Centier Investors is a global asset management group managing $247.3 billion of assets as at 30th of September 2021. They have 17 independent teams operating across equities, fixed income, listed and direct infrastructure, and multi-asset, led by principles of responsible investment and stewardship. They are home to FSSA Investment Managers, an Asian and global emerging markets equities investor. Stuart Investors, a pioneer in emerging market equities and sustainable investing, and Real Index Investments, a systematic equities manager. Hey guys, Ben Nash from XY Advisor here, and uh, today I'm 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 really excited. I've been um, actually nervously excited for the last little bit because we're chatting to uh, Australia's most relatable money guy, James Millard. Uh, James runs a, a business uh, called Sufficient Funds. He's the head financial advisor there, uh, and yeah, I'm keen to to pick Jimmy's brain. Uh, he has. Uh, been going for how many years you've been going there jimmy uh self-employed for about six we pivoted into sufficient funds about three and a half years ago uh and so yeah just talking about some of the lessons on that journey the things that uh james is focused on today and some of the uh things that have driven his business growth so james thanks for joining us buddy good to chat thank you ben thank you very much and um what an intro i wonder who wrote all that (laughs) Mate, I just pulled that directly from your, oh, no. your website, so I think that was you. <laughs> it might have been. But mate, you, as you say, you started uh, you started the business about six years ago um, under the Yolo brand, um, bouncing out of one of the bigger sort of um, sort of not institutional, but a, a, a bigger advice shop. Big, and yeah. Yeah, been a lot of uh, sort of evolutions on, on that path. I'm keen to get into a bit of that and some of the lessons that you've taken from there, but um, keen to pick your brain on uh, team stuff initially. I know you lead a fully remote team, which uh, we're just chatting offline, you know, used to be a little bit uh, different to the norm. But these days, everyone's sort of realizing that uh, we've, lost our, is, we've, yeah, we've so. lost our competitive advantage. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, but so, you know, you, you, you've grown from essentially yourself, you know, when, especially when, um, initially had a couple of business partners, then transition to the sufficient funds brand, um, uh, running it yourself and you build a, uh, a, a pretty chunky team behind you now. Um, I think, you know, we realize as a business owners in particular that, uh, you know, as your business grows, that it, it, the sort of team ends up being the business, um, and yeah, it's an interesting environment at the moment. I think that focus on team, people working from their bunkers, um, you've been doing it for a bit longer than most with a fully remote team. Uh, but I, I'm keen to, yeah, sort of get um, your learnings on some of the lessons that you've, you've found on how to actually ensure that you've, you know, uh, got a rock solid team that's not only filled with great people, but a team that's working really well together um, as a team. Yeah, awesome, mate. So yeah, I mean, you, you've nailed it with the intro. I think that's that pretty much sums it up. We it was probably three and a half, four years ago. It was kind of mid twenty eighteen. We we pivoted into. I'll keep saying your business name as I'm trying to describe mine. Um, <laughs> we moved into sufficient funds, and it was me and Laura at the time. And Laura's still with us. She's been with us. I'd worked with Laura back in the back in the uh, in the commercial days back when we were in the institutional world or, or the bigger business that you mentioned before and rolled out of that. And and I guess, I mean, for me, I'd come out of this this environment where it was a national, fairly large business, you know, multi, multi-million dollar revenue and running big teams. And I got back to the core of we were just the, we were the face of it and doing everything and, and slowly it's moved from there. But 
I guess, uh, you know, I never really sought out to build a big team again. My my gut feeling when I was kind of launching things and even pivoting to Savision Farms was trying to think about how I could outsource absolutely everything so I could be the only advisor. Um, and I learned very quickly that that, that goes so far. <laughs> yeah, You can't. And, and so we... Yeah, I mean, slowly started to bring on more. Randy was one of our first hires who was actually the mortgage broker because I was trying to do both. Uh, and and again, that was that was a bit crazy. Um, and so the mortgage broking side of the business was basically doing nothing um, for the first year until we found Randy and luckily he came on board and I'd known Randy for a while as well. And then it, it went from there. And so we built, there's a couple of brokers now and, and three advisors, including me, and the rest is support. And so we've got 13 in total. We're trying to find a power planner and uh, more of an entry level admin assistant at the moment. So, I mean, if that all goes well, we'll still have probably five client facing and 10 support, which for me has been, I guess, so imperative in in making sure that like my, the, the way I've always described it for me, and you gotta, you gotta practice this idea of pseudo laziness you can't try and do everything. And I mean, everyone knows this, but it's hard to actually put it into place. And I think yeah. that you've really got to focus in on trying to not do anything that you absolutely don't have to do. Um, and that's where we, you know, we, we brought in support. We've been lucky to find a good crew in the Philippines um, over time through Five Elk. And uh, we've got four there now and the rest are onshore. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, it's been a slow, a slow growth to 13 and most of that happened in the last 12 months. Um, mm. we probably doubled the team in the last 12 months. Um, and yeah, from here, I think more advisors, hopefully. Um, but you know, as we were just talking offline, it's, it's, it's really, really important to find the right people. Yeah, absolutely. And I know I, like you, when I started my business, I, um, wanted to keep it small. I didn't want to really run a team. Like I didn't start a business trying to build a, a huge machine or anything like that, but you do realize that it's challenging if you're the one that's that's doing it all. And I think that works if you're self-employed or it also works if you're an advisor within a business as well, that um, there's only so many things you can focus on. And I know that, um, yeah, we uh, started bringing people in because you go, okay, there's this work to do and then the work needs to get done and then you bring people in to do that work. But one of the one of the big shifts for me in particular off the back of the COVID stuff is that having a real focus on how a team works together, making sure that people are, they have a clear progression plan that they're not just, you're not just going, okay, there's the job, but it's like, okay, well, you're a, you're a person, you've got your development goals that you want to do, the things that you're interested in and one of the fortunate things I think in a growing business is that you can sort of shape um, people and, and you know, push them into a role that you can carve away over time the the things that are that are less exciting for them and then put them more into the things that they're they're more interested in and then that ties back to you know the satisfaction and um, uh, how people are, are working and, and and ultimately you know that that works to the success of the actual um, business but look, you know, it's, it's, we we're just chatting offline, like it's challenging out there at the moment to find good people. I think that, you know, my take on it is, and we've been, we've been hiring for, um, you know, senior financial advisors for like five months um, and associate advisors as well looking for like, it's, um, I think that there's a bit of fatigue with all of the COVID disruption, especially last year. Um, and we're obviously Sydney based and, and looking for someone that, that is, a, is around Sydney that, um, that and we're a bit uh, sort of precious here that we've got it a little bit sort of easy-ish at the start that we had our lockdown and then sort of got to the other side of it, but then thrown back into lockdown for a longer time. And that, um, yeah, I think, the, like I say, fatigued and, and just sort of a bit over it at the back end of the year, starting to see a bit more activity now with the new year and people sort of thinking about these things again. But for you, like, and um, I know we we're just chatting offline. You're saying that you built your uh, team primarily through your network, but 
I'm interested in like what have been some of the big learnings for you from a from a hiring and and recruiting perspective in growing your team from essentially the two that you started with to 13 today. So, man, I think naturally for me, I my personality ends up being that I really care about people and I want I'm interested, right? And I'm interested and I ask a lot of questions and I think naturally and this is how it's always evolved with clients for us is we, we've built a business model around really digging into who they are and what they want and spending a lot of time on that. And, and I guess it's the same thing for staff. And so for me, I mean, once you've hired them and, and we can go back to that part in a sec, but once you've got them on board, it's the, it's the holding them that's really important. I mean, knowing if they're the right fit and obviously making sure they are, but if they are, then just doing whatever you can to care, show an interest and like you say, help them progress help them see what mm. that path looks like, talk to them about what they want. Don't try and fit them into whatever that box might be that you may need. Uh, and yeah. if they're, you know, for us, I mean, we've had staff that have moved, shifted direction a bit over time and and um, that's been more driven by their talents and their interests. And I guess ideally that means that they will stay. And so hiring, I mean, we, we've got a couple of interviews this afternoon for power planners and we use the jobs board, the X, Y jobs board for that. And it's been phenomenal. It's the first time I've used it. And like I said before, you mentioned that with the networking, we've been really lucky and I would encourage everyone out there to, you know, I know it's been tough in the last couple of years, but just get to those industry events and meet people. And, you know, we were lucky. I mean, we, you know, you and I worked in the, with the AFA for a while, um, done a lot of work with that industry side of things and those mm. hard yards are paying off right you get exposure yeah. by doing that type of thing you meet all the other potential staff that could be coming in they and they you know if you take an interest in these people and show your face enough well eventually there's enough out there for and for us so far it's been the network from previous business through to doing a lot of work in the industry as well to now having a decent pool of people to just go, hey, it might not be you're hiring them in particular, but you can tap them on the shoulder to ask who they know and mm. and run it from there. And so that we've been lucky. Um, one, because, I mean, Laura and Randy both work, I'd worked with previously and that was an easy one. And from there, mm. Randy's been able to build the team through his network in the mortgage broking side. Um, so, yeah, the I think, I mean, in terms of hiring You've got to, firstly, you've got to really understand what you need. Otherwise, you're wasting your time and, and really make sure you've got the right strategy around the business and the right structure and, and thinking about where you want to be and, and what those immediate steps might look like, but also what are the two to three, four year time frame and, and what might this person be able to help you do. Um, with advisors, I know you're talking about trying to find a senior advisor at the moment. That's probably, I mean, we've got Cara who's who's amazing and if i could clone cara williams three times i would um and and we'd have we probably have some of the work to you know the work to do for, for them to cover off on but um and 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 one reason that works so well is cara's really good personality wise she gets it and she understands people and she's got really high eq and i guess on that note that's something we've always looked for um mm. I want people with emotional intelligence in every role because of course, that's, yeah. that then drives the ability to talk to people and that means the team all gets along and obviously whenever they're dealing with clients, it's uh, that's imperative. Yeah, and how I'm interested because that's something that I was, uh, you know, one of the things that I did in uh, over the break was just looking at our roles and figuring out essentially like what is the ideal person, what do they look like from a values, work, approach to work, you know, skill set, all of those things. And then I've been reading tons of books about um, like, you know, recruiting and hiring and teams and management and that sort of stuff. And the, obviously the emotional intelligence thing comes up and I think we broadly understand that that's important. How do you actually, how do, how do you dig into that? Because I feel like you can tell when someone doesn't like is has a really low emotional intelligence, but then there's a like there's this range between like okay to really amazing, um, which is sometimes well often it, it's certainly in my experience been sort of a bit challenging to figure that out before you before you spend tons of time with them and get them into the role and see how they work with with people team and clients. I mean, I think just purely by the nature of the fact that you're talking about emotion, it is there's a lot of sensing that rather than 
you know, the checkbox of what you're trying to find. And I think mm. you'll get, I mean, if you're interviewing someone, what I've found is you'll, you'll, you'll vibe them, right? You'll be feeling it. It'll be, it'll be that, okay, these people click with who you are. You're trying mm. to create a business. You're the center of the business. You know what the business needs. And then, and there is a, I mean, there is a gut feeling that needs to be relied on there and, and, you know, as the business owner or, or the hiring manager or whoever it might be, you've got to you've got to be fully in tune with what you need and what the business, uh, what drives the business and the core values of you know who you're looking for. And then I think from there, it's probably more asking a lot of questions. Um, and it might not be strictly EQ, but I, I'd be more kind of looking at well, you know, you're not necessarily diving too deep in a, in a job interview, but understanding what makes people tick. And just like clients, if you get that and then you can give them the, the solution, for lack of a better term, I hate that word, but if you give them what they need that links to what they care about, everything comes together, right? And so, mm. yeah, I mean, I think emotional intelligence, I, I mean, I, I haven't been reading as much, but I would say that it's probably a lot more of a sense rather than a checkbox. Um, mm. but, but in saying that, you know, like you know, you, you can you can cross them off straight away if you know if they don't have yeah. it. It's that it's kind of that middle ground where I think pushing a bit harder and asking a lot more questions about who they are and and if they're not giving you the answers that you feel will gel uh, with mm. either the team or the clients, well then that's when they, I think you probably need to move on. Mm. I actually I've got a mate that's an organisational psychologist and I hit him up after doing a bit of this reading and I was like, hey, I was like, is there because I'm like. I like quantifiable, you know, data-led stuff. And I was like, what's the, he helps us with a lot of the psychometric testing that we do when we, when we hire a team to make sure that they're fits for the roles that we, that we're looking at them for. And uh, I was asking him about the emotional intelligence stuff, bit of, bit of a rant, but um, there are some tests that you can do for that, but they need to be administered by like a proper, like full on psychologist. And I feel like it's might be, might be like a bit of a bridge too far to, you know, you do your interview and send them off for the psycho session off the back of it. But, uh, you know, I don't know. You never know. Oh, Maybe well, not food for thought for sure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Uh, mate, last quick teams based question for you, but you've been running a remote business for, for a while. And I think now all people are running, running pretty much running sort of some level of remote um teams or working in remote teams um what do you think of the the top sort of one or two things that uh that make that work or um that that can make that work better that are important when you are working in this sort of um uh, non sort of traditional office type setup environment I mean, I think number one, it's the social factor, right? Because, I mean, you need to create that social factor. And I mean, we, the base of that for us is just using something like, well, we, we use Voxer and everyone's on it. Um, and Voxer, for anyone who doesn't know, is the walkie talkie app where it's a lot of everyone's on the one crew in the morning and everyone's, hey, good morning. And there's a lot of chit chat. There's a lot of gifts being shared around. There's a lot of the fun stuff that, that just keeps people kind of feeling like they're a part of a team rather than sitting in their own bunker, as you say, um, in the middle of wherever, right? So, we, I mean, we can mm. hire. I don't care where you live. <laughs> it doesn't really matter. Um, it does cost yeah. us a little bit more when we try and bring them all together, but uh, that's that's the point of it, right? And so, mm. um, look, there, there's there's that part and there's there's scheduling, whether it's um, – and, and one thing kind of we're looking at now is at, at the moment is now that the team is the size that it is, is it's not just one big team meeting all the time, but making sure that there's random scheduled one-on-ones or, or, or two or three, four people, just put it in the calendar and catch up. Catch up randomly. It's not about work. Just put your and, – and we kind of have started to, to think about bringing that in as a – as a, just a, another way of just kind of making sure there's always a contact point. Um, everyone knows what their role is and we could probably get by for months and months without worrying too much about that. I mean, I think we attract people that are very, I mean, clearly we're telling them that they won't be in an office. We're telling them that, you know, some people just vibe the office environment, right? And, and those people yeah. aren't going to come and work with us. Um, there are others that might have, you know, a young family and just be looking for complete freedom and never want to travel. Um, it's not everyone, but there are a lot of those mm. people that they've got enough. Go they've either got enough going on at home, or they're very comfortable just knowing that this is this is the role and the flexibility outweighs the the social aspect yeah. and the face to face. 
Um, but we're also really careful to be, I mean, we're highly flexible in terms of not clock watching. Um, if you need to be somewhere during the day, just go and do it. I don't want to know. Um, I don't care. Like we, you know, I, I think the key is managing based on outcomes rather than hours and, and just making sure that you've got that part right. So having mm. a good structure and system and understanding of things like KPIs and, um, and how much work people should be getting through uh, is, is pretty important. But that, that comes back to also, I guess, when you're talking about the hiring side of things, you've got to be able to trust people to be able to, to be autonomous as well. So there's a little bit of a different factor there. Um, mm. And I guess for us, we didn't have the challenge of moving out of the office environment where you could be shoulder tapping and, and or watching the staff and making sure or hearing the conversations on the phones. And so we, we yeah. didn't have that anyway. Um, yeah. And so that wasn't an issue for us. We, you know, we had, that was dealt with many years ago. And, and so, yeah, I think that for us, we were lucky in a way with that part, but. Yeah. I think that, uh, I think definitely like the outcomes focused is, is more of a, a trend. And I know that like for us, when we, uh, we were talking to the team and we we're constantly trying to get feedback on like, how can we, um, make it, you, you know, cr create a, an environment where people feel comfortable to, you know, work, work at their pace, but then you have to have those, the output is, is the key measure there. And we know that, you know, clients are going through, um, the, the, as long as they're, that's happening and they're getting the outcomes, uh, and not issues then for, for us, like, it sounds like for you, like if someone works late as a morning person and does that and knocks it out and that's okay if they're not then that's okay as well so long yeah. as the um things are getting there but i noticed it for for us and i like the the boxer idea that one of the things that we've noticed from the transition from the office environment to the bunker is that you just don't get those micro interactions through the day that if you're constantly working at home all of the time that you don't get the or someone hangs up a phone call and then you have a little bit of banter about something or something happens and then you just shoot the breeze even if it's only 10 seconds or 30 seconds or something that that gap yeah. is there so yeah. i like i like that idea of um of uh, you know throw a little gif and there's something there to to make the distraction because otherwise it's just zoom 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 and it's uh, yeah. all all work and you know I don't, I don't think we're built for for that no way. Um, and yeah, I mean, we, sometimes you have to force yourself to remember to do that, but it's just sharing like these clients, we just, you know, presented the plan. They loved it, blah, blah, blah. Well done everyone, whatever it is, right. Just little mm. things like that as well. Um, throwing the, you know, snapshots of Google reviews in whenever they come through that type of thing, whatever it is, uh, lots of that, um, is really important. Mm, I like it. Um, tell me, James, you, you, you know, six years essentially in, uh, you know, in, in doing what you're doing, what, what's, how have you gone about, um, uh, I suppose, building out the offering that you've currently got for clients and what's changed over that, over that period of time? So, I mean, we, we start, I mean, six years ago, we were so naive and overconfident to what we were going to do and how we were going to achieve it. We'd rolled out of a business that did absolutely everything. Um, including property and all sorts of other stuff um, to thinking that that was the solution, just throw everything in. And, you know, the more we do, the better, um, mm. which is clearly not the right way to go. And and to be honest, we tread, we trod water for, for two years. Um, we had a few clients coming through. It was not pumping in any way. Um, and in the, in the end, I mean, we were just trying, you know, as three of us trying to do way too much and not, really have any focus. And so, I mean, I'm probably looking at the negative side of it. There were definitely some positives to that, but I mean, a couple of things, the learnings from that was we went from the office to the, to the remote work um, that saved us rent at the time. It was things like that it was just startup decisions that ended up being uh, really key to who we are and where we are now. From there, I guess for me, I had, um, I had been blogging, uh, under the kind of sufficient funds brand personally and doing a lot of that more of a kind of what a, what makes me tick and talking personally about a lot of my story and, you know, whether it was financial or life or a bit of both. And and I guess over that time, I was starting to see that there was a lot of, I think there's a lot of value in what in, in just getting really stuck into 
the authenticity piece. And, and for me then, the business has grown purely off the back of everything that I think should be in advice that, that aligns with who I am and finding the team to then, who, you know, the ones that will get on board with that to then drive it forward. And so um, I guess the SF idea for us, I mean, our business model now is we, we have a paid starting session. We call it Defining Sufficient. Um, I did a session with Em last year on here with um, one of those Thursday chats where we dove right into that. So if anyone wants to go and check that out, we got really into the nitty gritty of what that looks like. But at a, at a higher level, it's it's really about getting stuck into values and and goals and all the things that people care about and really understanding. And so it's a 90 minute session. And I guess the outcome there really is they pay for it. We, we send it back. So we build it all in Canva and we send them a document that has a really good record of everything we've gone through. And then we quote them at the end for the plan. And we've basically got a straight one, one fee, two fees, depending on sometimes we're doing a part that we won't always do for clients. It depends if they need help with their cash flow or not um, mm-hmm. strictly. And so um, we give them the fee and most of them come on board. It's probably 90% now. Um, and, you know, the ones that don't might come back in a year or two. We've been constantly surprised with these clients that just go, oh, yeah, we, you know, we this got in the way and now we're back on board. But I guess from there, it's, it, I mean, for the, for the people we're working with, we're working purely with like really 20 and 30-year-olds, people in their 20s and 30s. And that core focus on life over money has been the key, I think, for us. Um, on top of that, and and you'll know this when you're working with higher income earners, you have to provide value. If you mm. if you're and and this is the funny thing about working, I think, pre- previously with people in their fifties and sixties is a lot of the time they just think they need an advisor and they've got a few things going on. They're not sure what to do with it. It's very different when you're talking with millennials who are like they've got sometimes limited resources, most of the time not. Um, mm. But you like you are forced, absolutely forced to tell, to, to show them how good it's going to be and what you're going to do for them. And it's results driven. And so it should be, so it mm. should be, but it's a different, it's a different ball game because, and so that, the good thing for that is it just forced us to be really clear on who we help, how we do it and what the results generally look like. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, we spend a lot more time kind of working on that part, stopping dealing with everyone uh, and and just really focusing on that. So, I mean, everyone knows you should be niching. I kind of, you know, you probably told me five years ago to do it and I ignored you. And, <laughs> and it was one of those things that we, you know, we should have absolutely got stuck into that earlier. But now that we have, uh, it's certainly paid off. And you know, I think for anyone out there who's just kind of wondering what to do, I'm just focusing on one thing focusing on one thing that you know you're good at, that you care about, that you like doing, that you know is valuable for clients and build it around that instead of trying to like, oh, that'll pay me, this will pay me, this works, cash flow, you know, try and get away from that as hard as that can be. Yeah, definitely. I think from an efficiency perspective as well that, you know, we've we've seen huge increases in the cost of running a financial advice business and delivering advice and, you know, massive uptick in compliance and you know a lot of that stuff it's it's good like it should um happen but the reality is that if you want to run a sustainable business or a sustainable offering it has to be something that's efficient otherwise you're going to have to charge you know uh, even more outrageous prices to be able to to actually deliver that work but um for a business owner uh, and for for from a business perspective even for someone that's not a business owner and in a team like the the more consistent you can be with what you're offering and what you're delivering for clients, then the easier it is to train people to manage your workflows, to manage the work, the output, the process, the clients, all of that stuff. And then in addition, that you you get really clear on what your value is, how you can demonstrate that for clients, and then what your message to market is and actually get cut through. And like we, like you, like we deal with a certain type of people and a big chunk of our clients, in fact, I'd say more than 80% of our clients are 35 to 45 <laughs> Now, we can still deal with 50 and 60-year-old clients, although we don't have that many of them just because of the nature of how we position ourselves in the market. But the process ends up being the same. As long as they're okay with the process um, and the solutions and the outcomes, the process is not wildly different. Um, in fact, it's exactly the same, but the um, 
the message cuts through to the Pete to those 35 to 45 year old tech professionals making half a brick like uh, as opposed to so you know a 50 year old person that's looking to do a transition or retirement strategy or something so um, I, I think for that and for clients you know for them to then refer the business uh, as well the, the again they know oh yeah these guys work with these people and they deliver this this and this yeah exactly and you might you might get the referral from the son or the daughter to the parent right and yeah and i mean the the first time that started happening for us we're like should we do this defining sufficient session we like slapped ourselves around and of course we should because it's still i mean everyone's got goals right everyone's got things they Mm. care about it's a different way of talking about it but you're right you're doing exactly the same thing it's just uh not necessarily the market but it could still work yeah and james where, where do your clients come from typically what's the sort of breakdown for the people that work with you so starting out, I mean, it was very much just um, from anywhere we could possibly find. Um, we made a few uh, strategic partnership calls, especially around joining with podcasts. And so we get we get lots of introductions from different podcasts now, um, more client facing podcasts that started probably three years ago. That was that was probably driving probably 60 or 70 percent of our new clients. Um, that's dropped away now to. Now we're getting a lot more, I guess we're kind of probably closer to that kind of critical mass point, which I don't like thinking like that because it stops you wanting to grow. But like if we'd stopped now and didn't grow, we've got lots and lots of client referrals coming through off the back of people we've started working with in the last few years. Um, So it's now probably closer to maybe 50% of new clients come from external sources. Um, mostly referral referral partners, strategic relationships with those guys, um, but not not necessarily accountants and lawyers and so forth. More the kind of podcasting and the media side of things. And moving forward, um, I mean, I guess our plan now is to de-risk ourselves further from those external sources a little bit. There, I mean, they're awesome and it works really well. But I mean, my my goal is to is to still be out there be the face of it get a bit more off the tools and do a lot more of that stuff personally um it's 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 the one thing that i think is it's been my greatest challenge in the last probably two years as we've been growing there's been so much to do Mm. uh and i've remained the advisor at the core Mm. of that for most of it that it's just been like I, i know last year i mean we got to december and i limped into christmas um, and I realized like I had spent probably 5% of my time on the business and nowhere near enough. And so, yeah, that's my challenge now. I think we're at the point where, you know, we probably need to start thinking about who, who are the coaches that we need to bring in to really start to kind of shred what we're doing, pull it all apart, look at, you know, where are the inefficiencies and so forth. I could do this stuff if I stopped, but. I think, you know, sometimes as, as you're well aware and, and, you know, I'm sure you support this is throw money at the people who can actually do it way better than you and will force you to do it as well. Um, mm. put you in a position where, so yeah, that's our kind of next challenge is kind of thinking about who are the people or at least a couple of starting points around that, um, getting the right people in to kind of help us guide some of that stuff. Um, cause my wife, she's, she's working full time. So Tash can't, Tash can't do it. <laughs> uh, like she used it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's one of those things that you, it's as you, especially as you start to build a bit of good traction in your, you know, it could be within a business or in your actual business, like you're, um, yeah, distracted. And we know that it's, you know, you want to keep your eye at the 50,000 foot level, but you also need to deliver on the day to day. So finding that balance is, is not an easy one. Uh, but definitely something that you need to do at some point and your business, like my business, it's like your, uh, yeah, you, you start as a face, you do the content, you do a lot of the partnership mm-hmm. stuff. Um, but ultimately like you've only got so many hours in the day and, mm-hmm. um, you're be, beyond the fact that, uh, your value, um, to the, to the, the, um, clients is like, can be more on the strategic side from a business perspective and what you do. Um, and you can only, you know, service so many clients, but 
your value to the business becomes that in those strategic things and bringing the right people in to support the growth and um, yeah, doing all of those things to to make it even better ultimately for your clients. But it's just that getting there part, which is uh, tricky. So um, mm. mate, if you, once you sort it out, just let me know. That'll be fantastic. <laughs> for sure, mate. <laughs> <laughs> uh james mate thank you so much for for sharing your your insights as um i've made a few notes there's uh, some solid uh, tips uh for for me definitely uh on the team side and um yeah good good to see you continuing to smash goals my last question for you is that if you could go back to yourself at the start of your career in in financial advice what would be the one piece of advice that you would give uh, little jimmy <laughs> Love it. We're going um, we're going back about 14 years now, mate, and my uh, grey hairs, um, I'm not sure if that's self-employment or, uh, or two young kids or a bit of both, but, um, mate, I mean, I, I had a very different start in financial advice to what most people had and where I was working for a business that just threw you straight into the deep end. And, you know, we, I spent however long getting qualified and doing all of that. And then we were just straight into it. And um, I guess that what I did get from that, what was phenomenal and what I've seen a lot of people miss out on was the actual ability to have conversations and try and build a relationship really quickly. Um, mm. All the things that that matter so much around how we engage people when we're in front of them. But what I didn't have straight away uh, and it took a lot longer to get that was some of the technical knowledge. And so you know, we'd studied it, but but it was all about, it was a, a lot more slow learning on the job. And um, there, I guess, you, you we are now forcing the the slower progress through it, even though it's not where I came from. It's the, it's the start of, you know, do, well, I mean, luckily the, the legislation now forces it a little bit because you've got the professional year and you've got to do the degree and you've got to do all of that. But I guess that mm. idea of working in para planning or, client servicing, but also power planning and really understanding the core of how to deliver advice before you're actually out there doing it gives you mm. a different, I think it's an appreciation that it took me a very long time to get. And so, yeah, I would say um, dive into, you know, most people who land in this world of technically have the technical ability or, or, or the potential at least. And so dive into that a bit, um, but at the same time, do not, do not lose the ability to learn to talk to people. You've got to learn that if you want to be in front of clients. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I'm sure that if you asked your team, they'd be happy for you to take a bit of the uh, SOA writing off their hands if you want to get a bit more foundation <laughs> in that uh, in the admin. But um, I, I think understanding those processes, I know that I've got mates and they struggle that if people that go straight into that advice role without seeing the stuff that sits behind the scenes, it stops you from being able to manage the clients in the way that they need to because as much as we know that the, you know, a lot of the value is in those conversations and the coaching and the guidance and those things but uh, you need to know when the rubber's hitting the road because that's where it can be uh, frustrating for clients if it's not happening the way that they want and if you don't have that understanding you just push to the team like um, yeah, it doesn't happen in the same way yeah, so 100% good advice there mate Jimmy thank you so much for joining us buddy really appreciate Thanks, it Cheers, pleasure man. mate thank you yeah.